Hello, welcome to the QT World Summit 2020. My name is Mohamed Balu, CEO of Mad Labs Embedded Solutions, and today I'll give you a hands-on tour of embedded Linux system calls in QT. Here's an agenda of today's talk. First, we'll go over the QT event loop, and we'll understand why anybody would want to make system calls. Then we'll talk about how system calls are invoked canonically and why that canonical mechanism of making system calls conflicts with QT. Finally, we'll see how to correctly invoke system calls in QT. Now, a little bit about myself. My name is Mohamed Bilou, CEO of Mab Labs Embedded Solutions. I'm an embedded software consultant with a core expertise in embedded Linux. I help my clients with their Yocto project or open, and open embedded PSP customizations, whether it be driver development or helping them with their board bring up. We also do application development, whether it be in QT, uh, with a wide range of applications, including computer vision, networking, and a little bit of machine learning. I recommend that everybody sign up to our BIOS food newsletter. Uh, you can do so by scanning the QR code here. Uh, this newsletter gives you monthly updates on news, workshops, and webinars, and courses that we're planning on holding, uh, along with tips and tricks that we've discovered in our regular project work, as long as uh, along with the latest developments in the embed in embedded Linux. So now let's get into it. Qt uh, is is actually its own framework, and it's somewhat like an ecosystem. Um, it is it is an ecosystem, and it's somewhat like an operating system. It's responsible for managing hardware access, network access, user interaction, and the UI itself. So it's responsible for managing these aspects along with many other uh, typical elements that you would want to uh, exercise when you're developing a UI application or any sort of application um, in an embedded system. Also importantly, it, it handles threads uh, really nicely and natively within the framework itself. Now let's talk about the QT event loop. It's a sophisticated scheduler that ensures that the UI app runs perceivably smooth. It's responsible, it's a really complicated uh, framework that's responsible for ensuring and maintaining that any sort of elements uh, that are based on time in your application are as smooth as they can be. Now, one important thing about the QT event loop is that because it is an ecosystem and because it is a really, uh, really complicated and thorough framework, it's important to remember that you stay inside the framework itself. So that means that we, we try as much as, as much as we can to leverage QT data structures in a QT app that we're using now. That may not always be the case uh, because there are certain uh, custom data structures that we may need to implement uh, in C++ to make sure to, to fit within the business logic that we're trying to implement. But it's generally best practice to make sure that we're trying to leverage and use QT data structures as much as possible in a QT app. Um, and, and we have to keep in mind the reason for doing this is that a lot goes on in the background of even the simplest QT application. And by maintaining and, and leveraging QT data structures and remaining within the framework itself in, in our ecosystem, it ensures that the application functions well. Uh, we, there's a lot of, QT has been around for a substantially long time. A lot of really smart people have worked on ensuring that it is, uh, that is performant. Um, and that it works really well. So it, it behooves us to leverage uh, their expertise and their decades of implementation and knowledge uh, to use the data structures that they've developed so that our application runs as smoothly as possible. And if we do have to, you know, there may be instances where we have to implement a solution with our own custom data structures, for example. Um, we There is no strong guarantee that our application or the component of the application we're trying to develop will be performant. It can result in sluggish or slow behavior in the UI, or it can result in anomalous behavior as well. So it's really important that we stay within uh, the framework itself. Now, let's talk about system calls. Um, so generally, uh, as we all know, when we're developing software in general and embedded software specifically, that making systems calls, system calls are generally found, frowned upon. The reason for this is whenever we make a system call, the operating system, uh, in this case, Linux, um, has to go through a pretty extensive resource um, uh, 
intensive resource hungry process to invoke a potentially simple system call. So it needs to, for example, spin up another process, um, incur a massive context switch because it's effectively creating another process. There could be massive overhead in, um, again, setting up this process and it may not be portable. Uh, invoking a system call on one platform or one system may not necessarily translate to another embedded system uh, or platform. And instead, uh, instead of making a system call, it's generally recommended to use some sort of open source library um, or even a library that's compiled for us that may be closed source um, and make direct function call instead of actually making a system call ourselves. Um, so the, the question is, why does why would anybody want to actually make a system calls if, the, if, if they're that bad? So um, the reason for that is sometimes that's the only option that you have. So for example, if there's a particular library uh, or application um, that you want to leverage, the source code may not be available or uh, the source code that you're trying to comply, compile, uh, you may run into issues due to particular versioning or maybe the latest version uh, doesn't work as well compared to the one that you're trying to make a system call or there may be bugs, for example. Um, and sometimes compilation into a library may not be feasible uh, just because uh, the implementation of that particular application as a library may not be supported and may take a massive amount of time and effort uh, to get it to compile. So in those cases, um, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine um, to make a system call because the alternative to actually using the source code properly or compiling it into a library uh, may be so uh, extensive in terms of time and resources that it may not be feasible. And instead, you must, we must resort to making a system call. So this is uh, a simple C++ application that demonstrates how to make a system call. Uh, of course, we have our, uh, our header um, and, and incorporating the namespace uh, for, for the standard library. Uh, we have our main, and then all we need to do is just make a call to the, the system function with whatever we're trying to, whatever whatever system call we're trying to evoke, and then of course return zero. So this is how we would normally go about if we didn't have a QT application in making a system call. Now, if we try to implement what we just saw in the previous slide within the QT framework, we're going to run into a slew of issues. And that's because system calls by their nature inherently clash with the Qt framework. So it remember, Qt has this event loop. The Qt framework has this event loop um, that is responsible for managing uh, the UI, for managing timing. And by creating system calls or by invoking system calls, we're creating another process. And we're essentially uh, short circuiting or even just completely leaving the entire event loop that's a part of our uh, Qt app and its own process and we're disrupting the scheduler entirely. So um, because of this, system calls inherently are not necessarily compatible with the QT framework. So how do we get around this? So like, like I said before, um, we have to stay inside QT, right? So just repeating this slide again, um, when what, if we want to make a system call with Qt, again, we have to stay with inside and we have to find the appropriate data structure that allows us to make system calls within the Qt framework. And the key to, do, to doing so is uh, the, the class Qt process. Um, and it's really straightforward. It's used to start external processes. And we can also communicate with these processes and get info. We can send input as if we were uh, sending data through standard in and we can receive output as if we were receiving data from standard out or standard error. And we can use this class to allow us to implement system calls within the Qt framework. So let's see how to actually uh, go about creating a system call using the Qt process class. So here um, we create an instance, we create an object of that class, uh, Q pro of, of the Qt process class called mbash process. And here we're just going to um, create a, a simple bash terminal for us as a holding ground for us to invoke a uh, potential system call. So we're, and the way to do that is we're just going to uh, call the start method of the queue process class and pass it bash, right? And so this is gonna make start and maintain the bash process for us throughout the duration of however long we want to maintain the process. So like I said, one of the one of the neat things about Q process is that we can 
also receive standard out and standard error, uh, which are typical things that we would want to do whenever we want to make a system calls. Generally, there's some output that we're looking for to indicate success or failure. And we, it's important that we can receive this information to take the appropriate action. So in order to do that, all we have to do is just make uh, a call to, we just tell the QT framework that we want to um, connect um, the appropriate um, um, signals to this particular uh, class, to this particular object that has these slots for to, that, that are invoked whenever uh, these signals are triggered. So whenever there's output on standard output or standard error, um, the appropriate uh, functions within this class, within this test class, will be called. The appropriate methods within this test class will be called. And so whenever we receive anything either in standard out or standard error, we will, we will know, we will be able to act upon that in these methods. And here uh, we, we can see that, again, whenever there's data to be um, that's, that's output on standard out, this method is called, and then we can read that information by just calling read all standard output. And so it's pretty straightforward to be able to start a process um, or start a holding ground for a system call. And then whenever standard out, whenever there, there's data available in standard out, uh, we can read that data using this read all standard output method, along with uh, the corresponding method for reading standard error. So how do we actually, now that we have our, uh, let's say our process, how do we actually go about um, in, uh, now that we have our batch process ready to um, accept the command, a system call, how do we go about actually formulating that? So all we need to do is simply create an object of type Q byte array, append the string of that corresponds to the system call that we want to make, and then effectively pass that to the, the queue process that we've already begun. So essentially here we just have a simple um, system call to basically connect to a Wi-Fi network with a, with a specific SSID along with a password. And then we simply um, call the right method on that, on that, on that class. Um, and that should basically, it would, as, it, it would be as if we're uh, writing this on the terminal of the platform that we're using. And then the last thing that we want to be able to is, is, is let's say if we want to keep that um, that process around, then we can um, basically um, whenever, so the finished, the finished um, method in this, in this case is called whenever the, the process is complete, right? So whenever this process that we, we write to the process that was, that's already begun, whenever we uh, write the system call uh, to that process and it's complete, um, the finished um, signal is, 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 is triggered. And then in here, we want to, again, restart the bash process so that it's waiting, so that it's ready for us um, to feed it the next, next system call. We don't want to do it uh, right before we actually want to pass a system call because there um, is some non, there is some amount of time that passes between the start, with the call to the start method, and when um, the bash, the process is ready to actually ingest uh, an input, in this case, whenever bash, there's be some time from when we call start to when bash is ready to um, ingest the appropriate system call. So uh, that was just a quick summary of how we can um, leverage or how we can invoke system calls within the QT framework. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, this session and I look forward to, to chatting with you in the future. Thank you.